Welcome back to the Fishing Daily Podcast. Today I'm joined by E. O'Donnell from the Irish Fish Producers Organization. Welcome, E. Good, Oliver. It's good to meet you again. E, uh, you're in Brussels at the moment. Um, and yesterday, yesterday, the Fisheries Commission's talks with the Norway ended. And what was the feedback from the Commission on the talks? Well, essentially, the fish Fisheries talks have been paused, as, as they call it. They've kind of, in a kind of a way, they've broken down. There's a range of issues that um, are blocking progress in the talks. Uh, amongst them, obviously, is the issue of the Irish position in relation to the access for the Norwegians as a third country to the Irish zone to catch very large volumes of blue whiting. How important is it for Ireland to have? a say in, in, in what's going on in their, in their own waters? Well, it's really important that we have a say in what's going on in our own waters. Um, we have to remember that access is a very important issue. It's a key commodity. It's a currency in relation to what we achieve. We have the Norwegians who this year will have a quota in excess of 400,000 tons of blue whiting. Most of this species is caught and spawning in our economic zone. As a result of Brexit, the famous Brexit issue, the Norwegians have been displaced from the EU zone. So they really need to access our waters to catch their fish. We don't have a problem in principle with this, but there has to be some form of a dividend in relation to the access issue. And we feel very strongly about this and that needs to be negotiated at EU level. Are you confident that the Commission will come up with a deal that will work for, for Ireland? Well, we're confident that the issue has been raised. We're confident that the Minister is appraised of the importance of it. Uh, we're confident that he's going to make a strong case. And Ireland is a good European. Uh, we perform well within the European uh, arena. And we have a say, we have a role in our consultations with the Commission. So it's really an important issue now that the Commission negotiation mandate reflects that priority. Uh, yesterday, I, I was speaking to uh, a Nor Norway-based fisheries consultant, Ian Kinsey, and Ian was saying that, well, Ian would be knowledgeable about what would be happening in, in, in Norway. And he was saying that the other European countries are looking for additional quote, cod quota and the Arctic zone of the Nor Norwegian EEZ. Was there any word about that between yourselves and, and the Commission? It's really important to understand that we're talking about two separate things here, Oliver. The issue of the Arctic cod is really important to the Spanish, the French, the Germans, the Portuguese particularly. The Irish would benefit very little from a transaction in relation to this species. And for example, last year the European Commission would have traded 31,500 tons of EU blue whiting as a swap so that the other member states would get, get up to 10,000 tons of Arctic cod. It's very important to the other member states. We do not object to this. It's a separate issue. But the Norwegians separately are trying to get access to our waters to catch their blue whiting, including that transfer from Europe. Uh, and from a negotiating point of view, that issue of access to the Irish water is being conflated with the issue of the transfer. They're two very separate issues. What are the options that's, that's on the tables? Have you, have you uh, had word back from the Commission? What's, what, what's the Norwegians looking for? and What's the Commission looking for on behalf of the Irish? The Norwegians are quite clear, to be fair to them, and we have to respect that they negotiate very well and very firmly in their approach to, to these things. They're looking for a traditional uh, swap of blue whiting for their Arctic cod. They've also asked for an increase in that. that. That is a traditional, long established swap arrangement to the benefit of other EU member states. We get 3% of that cod. The only issue there is the quantum of blue whiting that is swapped. And I'm sure the commission will come to some form of settlement on that, which ultimately we will support. Although it's important that the value for money in that is fair. Separate to that, there's the issue of the access to the Irish zone. 
On that, we feel very strongly. The Norwegians, for their part, because they need this access to catch their blue whiting quota, uh, see it as being paramount, and they're making it a very important issue of the overall deal. But we must remember that Norway will have a quota of 400, maybe 450,000 tons of blue whiting. We will have a quota less than one ninth of this. They have a vessel fleet of approximately 280 vessels. We have about 23 to 30 vessels of the same class. So it's really important that the Commission, our member state officials, and our minister defend our position in that regard. Well, we've sort of been down this road before where we put our trust, trust in the EU to do the right thing for, for Ireland. And that was back in the Brexit talks. But now we're finding yes. that we got, you know, at that time, we were basically sold out. We lost a yes, lot of quota and, and those talks. And then trying to um, get burden sharing and yes. anything from the EU in that respect. After that, all the promises that they'd made beforehand was broken. So, you know, we can understand the concept that people don't really have that trust in the EU Commission to come along and, yeah. and, and to deliver what, what you are asking for. Well, I think the most important thing in all of this is that we have to clearly articulate our position. As representatives, there's a number of representative bodies out here last week and this week. We work with other POs and with the Irish fish processors and exporters, and particularly with the South and West, to get the message through to the Commission, to the Commissioner whom we met last week about this issue. And also, it's really important that we engage with the representatives our, our peers in Europe, who some of them had a very distorted view as to what we wanted, and they misunderstood what we were looking for. And we've explained that very clearly. So what we're trying to do is get a consensus view that is a very strong sympathy for the Irish position. They know that we handed over 40% of the total transfer in the Brexit deal. They know we got a bad deal. We're decommissioning a third of our whitefish fleet now as a result of that. And it's really time to call halt to this process and to get some form of meaningful engagement. Really, really important that the minister goes into this process with a proper mandate with agreed with the officials and with the EU negotiating team to secure some form of meaningful dividend for Irish fishermen. We need to turn the tide on this. And industry at both catching and processing sectors are firmly of the view uh, no deal is better than a bad deal. Access cannot be granted if the deal doesn't match. Well, we're heading now into the Agri-Fish Council um, tomorrow and on Monday. We'll be hoping to see an improvement on some fronts there, even though we will be losing more quota because of the trade and cooperation agreement. But you'll be hoping that your, or your members will be hoping that they'll, they'll be seeing an increase maybe in, in hake and what other uh, fish I mean, there? obviously, a lot of this is going to be driven by the science. Uh, it's important that at a political level that we get benefits that match the science where possible. There are some key species that are getting an increase. There's some increases in nephrops, and we also have nephrops members who are very important to Ireland, and nephrops fishermen suffered a lot under Brexit. So the science is positive there. So hopefully at a political level, now that we're getting through some of the technical discussions, that there will be a positive outcome for some of these species. Horse mackerel is in a bit of trouble. That's still being negotiated. Um, but the really positive one, obviously, for the pelagic sector is that there's an 81% increase for blue whiting. Um, but it's important, apart from the fact that there's a quota increase, that there's a just and fair arrangement in relation to the access. Access is where the opportunity lies to try and improve the Brexit situation. Well, at Wednesday's Joint uh, Committee on, on Fisheries uh, and, and the Arachthus, we, we heard you speaking and, and we, we heard some facts from uh, Sinn Féin's yes. Audrey McLaughlin on how much the industry has declined and the figures yeah. that he was giving out was how much the industry declined 
pre-Brexit. Yes. And we probably don't have really a clear idea yet of what the post-Brexit is because we had, we've had COVID and now we've had yeah. the Ukraine war. You're, what's it like at the moment? We're, we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of fishermen applying for decommissioning. Do you yeah. think the whole circumstances that's been surrounding since Brexit, COVID, and the the war in Ukraine, do you think that's driving a lot of the fishermen to consider decommissioning and getting out of the industry? Yeah, I mean, the resilience of certain segments of the fleet are really under uh, in a difficult situation. The profitability has gone out of big segments, particularly of the demersal fleet. Also with the quota cutbacks in relation to horse mackerel, for example, in the coming year, uh, and the mackerel situation is still relatively uncertain as to whether it's going to be cut or whether it be a small increase or not. Uh, people are facing into a very difficult situation. And the other external factor, obviously, is the cost of fuel. I mean, uh, from a European assessment point of view, it's felt that they, they suggest that 60 cents a litre is the economic price for marine fuel for vessels to be resilient. The actual fact is that the uh, price has been well in excess of a euro for much of the time since last March. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to avail of any aid measures to help them. So it's a whole range of external factors there getting at the industry. We've also had the tie-ups, which are a temporary stopgap measure. Um, they also have indicate, shown the situation where fish landings were much reduced. So. We can feel that in our bones. So all you've got to do is drive through the main ports and see the number of vessels that are tied at the pier. Um, the challenge here is we also still have vessels from other member states and non-EU states out there fishing. So we have to get some benefits back. We have to address the access issue. And the minister quite rightly has pointed out that we need to address the ICAT issue on things like bluefin tuna to give some form of uh, alternative fishery for our vessels. Going back a little bit on onto the fuel, the minister said there's nothing there for him to cut because there's no tax and excise on on the on the diesel. There is on, on yeah. petrol for for intro fishermen using petrol engines. Uh, and the VAT's fully reclaimable for, for the fishermen. But could the minister go further and say like subsidize the fuel maybe 20 cents a litre or something yes. like that? Yeah, I mean, the reality was, of course, uh, in the late autumn, uh, the French were paying 65, maximum 70 cents per litre for fuel, and we were paying 95 to a euro. They were availing of a subsidy of up to 35 cents per litre. Uh, in fact, it was economic, it was attractive for certain boats in the southwest of Ireland to land their fish into France rather than to land them back to Ireland because of the fuel subsidy. So the measures have been approved. There has been, there is, there is some funding in place still from the old EMFF uh, that could, could be used. And we urge the minister, particularly with the coming season from January 1, to implement those measures because they're really important to the fleet. Is there a timescale on, on this fuel subsidy? Is it, is it, is it running out? Uh... Will it run out at the end of this year or 2023? No, I, my understanding is that it's it, it's not to run out at the end of this year. There are some caps on the total level of subsidy that can be availed of depending on the country, but the caps are quite high. The French, the Spanish, the Belgians, and I believe even the Swedes have implemented varying levels of fuel aid measures. It's a really it's a, an important. Uh, competitive laying, playing field situation. It needs to be level. To compete, we need to have fuel at the same price as our overseas competitors. Right across the board, we need to be on the same, as you say, on the same level playing field. Yeah. There was yeah. a talk about the, the tie-up scheme and yes. everybody going for the decommissioning scheme. If you had applied for, if you're applying for the decommissioning scheme, you have to give back the money that you have yeah. from the thing. And that was questioned in the, in, the, in the Joint Committee on Wednesday. Yes. And it seems to be very unclear. It's clear on our part, on, on, on the Irish fishing end of it, that the DG competition has said, you know, if, we're going to, if you're going to do this, 
decommissioning, you will have to give back your money in the tie-up scheme. But it's unclear now where whether the other countries are in the same uh, boat, to say, more to say it, uh, because were they in, were they did they have tie-up schemes or was it just us that had tie-up schemes? So it, it, it doesn't seem to, it seems to be a little bit unclear. Yeah, the, it needs a little bit of work, Oliver. Uh, certainly, other member states have implemented the um, full, the permanent cessation scheme in in different ways. Um, the Dutch themselves, for their part, have issues with the way they're implementing it because not only are they decommissioning the vessels, but in that instance, there's some form of decommissioning of the actual quota as well. Uh, it's important that there is clarity. Uh, the criteria had been changed a number of times, but um, uh, it, it just needs a little bit more work. Our, our processing industry, that's something that you, you were speaking about in, in the joint uh, committee as well. How much hammering is that taken? I know, I know it's not your, your area, it's more Brendan's area. But that's Brendan's it, it, area, yeah. But it does have, a, it does have a, also a knock-on effect as well on, on, on the boats because, you know, if, we, if we're going to end up Without the processing industry here, it's going to make fishing yes. even less viable. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the, the processing and the, the catching sector, they, they kind of go hand in hand. They rely on each other. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, it's really important for Ireland that we have a, a viable, internationally competitive processing segment. We have some very, very good businesses, very good companies that both are integrated and independent. We have good international markets. And that's why in the short term, we see a possibility of if we could get the access issue resolved, get some volume back to the vessels by way of quota. This needs to be addressed across the fleet in both whitefish and pelagics. But in the short term, there's an opportunity in the pelagics if we could get that up increased. Killy Beggs, for example, is the European hub for the food production of blue whiting. Um, they have developed markets. They've maintained the quality. They've got good brand acceptance. All they need is a fair crack on the supply. And unfortunately, for both whitefish and particularly for pelagics, the processing sector is now dependent on overseas. So quota shortage is a big issue nationally and we need to address that where possible we've seen that this year uh we had quite a few vessels from norway and denmark coming into kelly Beggs to yes. to land blue whiting and we now have a control plan fisheries control plan yeah. approved by the eu commission is it any different to what we had before how's it how's it going to work for your members well, we still have some serious concerns about elements of the control plan. We're quite firmly of the view that the control plan, the actual design of it, uh, there wasn't any prior consultation of any consequence with the industry. There are aspects of it which are not fit for purpose. Uh, the, the, the provisions within it, the protocols within it, particularly to do with things like the speciation and the sampling of the fish and the way it's documented are very complex, they're unnecessary, and they're, in some ways, from a documentary point of view, they're doomed to fail. So we've got to try and work with the competent authority to get that resolved. It's very germane, it's really relevant to the first-time buyers, the processors particularly. Uh, but we do need to compete. We need a harmonized control system, a procedure that makes sense, and um, that underpins the, the landing of fish from both domestic and overseas vessels into Irish ports. It was very complex this year when, when them vessels yeah. came in. And, and, and as you say, like something that we call that needs to be a lot clearer and maybe a lot simpler um, yeah. in order to make it easier for the Irish boats to exist and for, for any boats coming in into the country to land. I, th I think it's really important that we don't that we have uh, procedures and protocols that make sense. We don't want to displace supply, particularly from foreign vessels. We rely on them. Very often, the fish are caught well within our own waters, based on EU quotas. Uh, but we need to work together with the control authorities 
and have their cooperation to make sure that everything's fit for purpose. Well, Lee, thank you for joining me on the podcast here. And thank we'll be program. chatting to you probably after the Agri-Fish Council. And we'll hear from you of what, what, what happened there. Thank you very much, Oliver.